The man who would become known as the Hammer of the Scots and as the nemesis of the Scottish patriot William Wallace was born at Westminster Palace on the night of 17th to 18th of June 1239. Edward was the first child of King Henry III of England and his Queen Eleanor of Provence. Remembered as one of the more obscure and ineffectual monarchs of England, Henry was the son of the infamous King John and a direct descendant of William the Conqueror. Henry was thus culturally French. He, his nobles and his family all spoke Norman French, or at least a slightly anglicised version of it, and the kings of England, since William's conquest, held lands in France as well as England. True, Henry's father King John had lost most of the vast land holdings of Henry II's Angevin Empire, with only Gascony in the southwest of what is now France remaining, for which Henry paid homage to the French king as duke. But it's truer to say that the kings of England had been culturally French, or more accurately Norman and Angevin, for the 173 years since the conquest. Naturally then, Given King Henry was a direct descendant of the Conqueror, and his nobles direct descendants of his companions, names such as Richard, William, and, of course, Henry, were perfectly respectable choices for a king-in-waiting or a noble son. So why then, given this context, did King Henry name his heir apparent Edward? England, of course, had had Edwards in the distant past, but it was an old English name, and thus very much belonged to the side that lost at Hastings. Henry's choice, most likely, would have raised some eyebrows. The key to understanding why lies in Henry's earlier life. As a child king crowned at just nine years old, Henry had inherited a divided and war-torn kingdom, and had effectively been a political pawn until he finally assumed personal rule at the late age of 32 from his ministers. Unlike his more warlike ancestors, such as his uncle King Richard the Lionheart and King Henry II, Henry was unmistakably not a warrior, and unusually eschewed the normal princely pursuit of hunting, and even banned tournaments. This political impotence, aversion to war and the scars of his childhood, clearly ingrained in him a desire for peace, which was starkly embodied by another monarch very much in the same mould. Henry, to borrow a modern phrase, went completely fanboy for the royal patron saint of English monarchs, King Edward the Confessor, who by that point had gained the glowing saintly image that pious King Henry could only admire. Edward, too, had been politically impotent, being an outsider king in his own kingdom. He had lived in Normandy for most of his life before becoming king in 1042, fleeing the country when the Danes conquered it in 1016. Having no children, Edward was also thought to have been celibate, and this, along with his general reputation for piety, formed the skewed saintly image Henry so admired in his day. There are also striking similarities between them that may have influenced Henry's devotion. Edward, too, was no warrior, and relied heavily on his earls for military assistance. Edward had lost his father, like Henry, and been abandoned by his mother, growing up in a climate of war and uncertainty, just like Henry, with the fallout of the Baron's wars with his father. Edward the Confessor, finally, was also the king who had established the Royal Palace of Westminster in order to be near his abbey, which he spent the last years of his life building. Henry, too, strove to rebuild Westminster from 1245, spending huge sums to create the giant Gothic structure we have today. Given this context then, it's no great surprise Henry named his son Edward, and it's also probable that he timed his stay in Westminster to coincide with the end of his wife Eleanor's term so that the boy could be born and baptised there, as close as possible to the revered Confessor's Shrine. But why did Edward Longshanks become Edward I then? Actually, to chroniclers closer to Edward's time, he was known as the Third and on the surface, even more bizarre designation. We should count King Henry's beloved confessor, yet before him there was the celebrated Edward the Elder, son of Alfred the Great, and forger of England. But after the Elder, there was also Edward the Martyr, whose very brief reign was obviously overlooked, 
given R. Edwards' designation as the third, despite the fact that he should have been the fourth. This miscounting was probably due to the fact that the martyr's reign was so short, and, to 13th century minds anyway, distant and irrelevant. Even the confessor himself had been dead for over two centuries by 1272, when Edward eventually succeeded his father. Contemporaries usually differentiated Edward by linking him to Henry, such as King Edward, son of King Henry. After his death, matters were of course further complicated by the addition of two more Edwards in his son and grandson, so that by the 14th century it became easier to differentiate the trio by the first, second and third designations they have now. The confusion was further abated by numbering from the Norman Conquest, which until that point had been wholly unnecessary given all the aforementioned French names. Edward Longshanks then, among his more well-known accomplishments and effects, is also responsible for the numbering of monarchs we have today. With his, in retrospect, odd naming and birth dealt with, it's useful to wheel back slightly to explore the context of Edward's early years, and to do this we'll head back three years before his birth. The year is 1236, and a young girl sets foot on a foreign soil. Her name is Eleanor, and she is set to marry Henry, the King of England. She had never been to England, and had never even met her husband-to-be, yet, as it turns out, this match would be good. Unfortunately, it was not just Eleanor who arrived, marrying Henry on the 14th of January 1236. She had also brought with her her own retinue. On her mother's side of her family, she had six ambitious uncles who hailed from the Alpine Savoy region. First came William of Savoy with Eleanor in 1236, a magnate of discontent for the native barons until his death in 1239. A few years later, Boniface was elected to the prestigious position of Archbishop of Canterbury. Perhaps most important of all came Peter of Savoy, who arrived in England around Christmas of 1240 and quickly became a member of King Henry's inner circle. These men were collectively known as the Saviards and contributed to the new Queen's unpopularity as well as the wider discontent with Henry's government that would, as we shall later see, boil over into outright revolution. Peter of Savoy was an especially cunning and clever political operator, attaching himself to the Queen, his niece, and understanding that to maintain his place in Henry's inner circle was to remain close to her, and by extension her son, the heir apparent Prince Edward, who, as we've noted, was born in 1239, just three years into Eleanor's marriage. It was under this political umbrella that the early life of Edward Longshanks progressed. Peter moved quickly to secure the future king under his influence, assigning a Saviard clerk to oversee Edward's well-being, controlling access to the prince even before he himself had arrived in England. After his arrival, he swiftly replaced the constable of Windsor, the location being Edward's chief residence, with his bastard brother, Bernard of Savoy. Needless to say, this influx of Saviard foreigners into the centre of English political power was not welcomed by the established nobility, and would prove to be costly to King Henry's realm in both blood and treasure. Things began to sour when in 1247 King Henry welcomed members of his own extended family into the realm. Henry was the son of King John of England, but also of his queen consort Isabella, who hailed from the west of France but following John's death in 1216, she abandoned both Henry and England, marrying Hugh of Lusignan and having nine more children with him. By 1247, Henry's ambitious half-brothers were lord to England by its huge difference in potential when compared to their native land, with their royal half-brother Henry more than willing to accommodate them. To William and Aymer de Valence, he was particularly generous, making Aymer the Bishop of Winchester, and granting William lands, a pension, and even the hand of a rich heiress. Pensions were also pledged to Guy and Geoffrey de Lusignan, and Henry's half-sister Alice was granted the future Earl of Surrey as her husband. The tragic, whilst simultaneously comic thing was, was that Henry was likely not deliberately setting up an opposition to the Saviards, but was generally regarded as a kind, if somewhat 
politically naive man. There was certainly no animosity between king and queen. In fact, Queen Eleanor would staunchly defend her husband later on in the Civil War against Simon de Montfort, even mustering troops for him in France. However, in promoting the Lusignans, as they're commonly known, Henry had unwittingly created a deadly rivalry between the Queen's Saviard family and his own Lusignan half-brothers. 1252 saw matters turn violent. Amir and his brothers had a dispute with Archbishop Boniface and wanted to settle this by attacking two of Boniface's manors and roughing up several of his servants. However, if the Lusignan's penchant for violence was typical, then so was King Henry's blind spot for it. The Lusignans had been crucial to putting down a recent rebellion in Henry's French territory of Gascony, and this, along with his naive and blind affection for his family, conspired to stir up tensions. Enter into all of this the principal subject of our consideration, Edward. Prince Edward, the future Longshanks, was firmly within the Saviard camp, for now at least, and was wary of this new political faction. Resentment smouldered between the two factions, but the Saviards still had Edward, the future King of England, under their charge, and thus had the future of England in their hands, which may have been enough to assuage the more hot-headed of their number from taking overt action against King Henry's half-brothers, who were increasingly usurping their monopoly on the King's affections and favours. Henry may have been forgiven for dismissing the 1252 event and the animosity between the two factions as inconsequential. However, if so, this would soon prove to be wrong as war in Wales threatened to blow open the division into full-scale civil war. In April of 1258, King Henry III of England was confronted by an angry group of armed barons and knights who demanded what we would call today constitutional reform of his government. And this act was nothing less than revolutionary. They demanded an overhaul of how government was done. Henry would submit to a council of men and parliaments would be called at least three times a year. The so-called provisions of Oxford were just as important a milestone as the more famous Magna Carta and a political earthquake of its like would not be seen again in England until the days of King Charles I and the English Civil Wars. But how did this all come about? Arguably the catalyst for this shift in power was the debacle in Wales. 1247 had seen Henry occupy the Four Cantriffs region in which Prince Edward, in theory at least, held power. However, a decade of poor management and corruption on the part of royal officials had seen the region primed to explode. Matters came to a head when the Welsh leader, Llewellyn, led his army across the Conway River in November of 1256. Llewellyn then proceeded to clear the area of English occupation within just a few days, so that only the castles of Dyserf and Diganwy held out. The royal response was mixed. King Henry had instinctively wanted a diplomatic solution, and even wrote an anemic letter to Llewellyn relating his disappointment at the turn of events. In stark contrast, Prince Edward had been incensed and, according to Matthew Paris, quote, was determined to check the impetuous rashness of the Welsh, to punish their presumption and to wage war against them to their extermination. However, the obstacle to achieving this was money. Wars were, and still are today, ruinously expensive. Edward could not hope for much assistance from his father, the king, given that all his money had been tied up in his ridiculous adventure to place Edward's younger brother Edmund on the throne of distant Sicily. Edward had received a loan from his uncle Richard of Cornwall, but these funds quickly evaporated, leaving Edward to seek aid from his father. Henry in response essentially cut his son loose. To Edward's likely rage and frustration, Llewellyn was not so ineffective. The momentum of his invasion had snowballed, with dispossessed Welsh lords flocking to his banner. Victorious in northern Wales, he now drove south, attacking Derhabarth and Powys, the other traditional kingdoms of Wales. At Kidwelly and then in Gower, the English were on the back foot, with Swansea Castle being burnt to the ground. Edward had lands here too, especially Carmarthen and Cardigan, 
and so resolved to strike back here, perhaps to forestall any further Welsh gains and seize back the initiative. In the event, Edward, still in Westminster, never made it to his army as it was destroyed by the Welsh as it set out from Carmarthen on June 2nd, 1257. Even King Henry's own expedition in response to this was ultimately a failure. He mustered an army at Chester, taking back the four cantriffs, but due to a lack of supplies, specifically coming from Ireland by ship, Henry withdrew after just a month of campaigning, being harassed by the Welsh as he did so. Llewellyn simply retook the region, and once again besieged the castles of Dyserf and Digumwy. Llewellyn was triumphant, and even began pressuring local Welsh lords, up to that point merely allies, into recognising him as a superior in the winter of 1257-8. By March of 1258, Llewellyn was no longer simply the Lord of Snowdon, he was now the self-styled Prince of Wales. Prince Edward, meanwhile, took stock of his situation. His father had failed him, or more specifically his mother, Queen Eleanor, and her savvied faction, who actually controlled Edward's affairs, had failed him and allowed this Welsh upstart, as he saw it, to overrun his Welsh possessions. Edward had practically been under the control of the Savoyard faction at court from birth, with its rival, the Lusignans, until now unable to challenge the Savoyard hold on the young heir to the throne. However, Edward himself resolved to clear out his entourage. He took on his cousin, Henry of Alman, son of his uncle, Richard of Cornwall, but perhaps more telling was his alliance with the Marcher Lords. Perhaps, as well as his need to escape the grasp of the Saviots and regain his lands, Edward was also attracted by the semi-independent nature of the Marchers. The March of Wales was roughly the region comprising both the southern Welsh coast and the eastern border of England. It came into existence following the Norman Conquest, being forcefully expanded when the opportunity arose. But, these expansions were outside of the purview of the Crown, and thus the Marcher region maintained a unique political status. On the one hand, its lordships were governed like micro-kingdoms, given they were not bound to the King of England, yet they were also hostile to the native Welsh. Given this setup, it's no surprise that the Marcher lords were a breed apart, with their castles always well maintained, and their swords sharpened and ready. Llewellyn had not only expanded south, but also into Marcher territory, and so following the principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend, several Marcher lords found themselves in Prince Edward's inner circle by the Christmas of 1257. The catalyst for the coming political upheaval in 1258 then, was Prince Edward's alliance with the Marcher lord of Pembroke and his brother, the Bishop-elect of Winchester. To the Queen's horror, her son and the heir apparent had formalised an alliance with William and Aimer de Valence, his Lusignan half-uncles. This brazen political realignment was intolerable to Queen Eleanor and the Saviots. They had been losing influence over King Henry to the Lusignans, and now they had loosened their grip on Edward, with matters exacerbated by an attack by Aimer de Valence on the property of one of the Queen's advisers on April 1st. In truth, then, the conspiracy to curb Henry that formed into the provisions of Oxford was an uneasy alliance between the Saviots and other disaffected nobles who were equally disgusted with the behaviour of the Lusignans over recent years. That, along with Henry's political and military ineptitude, prompted the revolution that was soon to come. In April of 1258, Edward's father, King Henry III, awaited news on whether his request for another tax had been granted by his East Parliament. Henry had been harassing his subjects regularly to, among other things, finance the bizarre scheme to make his younger son Edmund King of Sicily. His answer came around nine in the morning on the last day of April. Seated in the great hall of the Palace of Westminster, a large group of barons and knights surrounded him, and they were arrayed for war. Armoured, the group had left their swords at the door, but nonetheless the implication was crystal clear. A startled Henry is supposed to have said, What is this, my lords, am I your captive? The Earl of Norfolk, Roger Bigard, 
spoke to Henry, demanding that he remove his hated half-brothers, the Lusignan faction, from influence, and instead only heed the counsel of those men now before him, including himself. As well as Bigod, two other formidable earls joined the revolutionaries, Richard de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester, and, of course, the Earl of Leicester himself, the silver-tongued and magnetic Simon de Montfort. The so-called provisions of Oxford were just as important as the Magna Carta, which was so famously forced upon Henry's father John, and essentially stripped away Henry's powers as king, leaving him a figurehead under the governments of others. Henry's government had been infested with corruption as well as incompetence. Under the influence of his Lusignan half-brothers, especially Peter, Henry had poured huge sums of money into the ludicrous project of securing the Kingdom of Sicily for his son, while his territories in Wales were overrun by Llewellyn ap Griffid. With Prince Edward, now allied to the Earl of Pembroke and the hated Lusignans, the barons and Saviard faction at court had had enough and attempted to break this new monopoly on the King and his heir to the throne. Under the provisions of Oxford, the King's chief ministers, particularly the Justicia and the Chancellor, would be chosen by and accountable to a council of 15 men. In addition, parliaments were to be held three times a year to address the grievances of all of Henry's subjects. To this end, representatives of the shires, but also, for the first time, the towns were called on to attend. Bigod, de Montfort and de Clare, as well as their allies, would now rule on such crucial matters as the distribution of royal lands and the custody of royal castles. Prince Edward, too, was not left unaffected. A council of four was set above him to regulate his affairs and was answerable to the fifteen. What is truly remarkable about the provisions is the radical shift in the idea of legitimacy. Heretofore, kings had also governed on the premise that their right to do so was divine and based on their God-ordained kingship, and this idea was deeply ingrained almost everywhere else. Kings, it was known, were only accountable to God alone. Yet such radical reforms implied otherwise. Now the king's rule was legitimate only if it conformed with the directives of the council. Of course, such restraints on the power of the monarch had been attempted in 1215 with Magna Carta, but had ultimately failed, just as the provisions in their purest form would. But nonetheless, such a programme of reform was radical and politically earth-shattering, to the point that nothing of its like would be attempted again until the time of King Charles I. Unfortunately for the reformers and the country at large, the king's sincerity in swearing to uphold the provisions proved false, as he obtained a papal bull in 1261 that released him from his oath, although the reformers, including de Montfort, attempted to set up an alternative parliament. It had failed chiefly due to the defection back to the royalists of Richard de Clare. At this point, Simon de Montfort fled to the continent and it seemed that the provisions at this time would be consigned to the dung heap of history. However, this hiatus proved fragile for Henry, given that within two years his triumph would suffer two major reverses. Firstly, with the reversal of the papal bull itself that absolved him from upholding the provisions, and then the death of his principal ally in the Earl of Gloucester, Richard de Clare, on the 14th of July 1262. The new Earl of Gloucester, Gilbert, declared his support for the reformers. Henry, it seems, had also not learned any lessons from previous years. The war in Wales had flared up once more. Without a permanent peace to solidify his hold on his new lands and his title of Prince of Wales, Llewellyn struck out, burning the middle march and even pushing into Herefordshire. Henry had also not just swept away the council, but all aspects of reform including combating corruption at the local level, which in turn made him dangerously unpopular. Throw into this mix the disaffection of barons such as Roger Clifford, Roger Le Bon and their companions, who were being harassed by the Queen's Saviard faction, and there is a combustible atmosphere in England by the time de Montfort returns on 25th of April 1263. As fighting broke out in the Welsh March, the two sides, the Royalists under King Henry and Prince Edward, as well as the Reformers led by de Montfort, built up their armies by the autumn, 
making civil war almost an inevitability. In an attempt to avoid this, Henry attempted to garner the support of the French king, Louis IX, by his arbitration. The resultant Mise of Amiens on the 23rd of January 1264 only exacerbated matters as Louis came down on the side of Henry, striking the provisions away as illegitimate. Many opposition barons were assuaged, but not the radicals under de Montfort. Both sides thus prepared for war. Much emphasis in popular culture is placed on Edward Longshank's later years and his Scottish opponents, chiefly William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. Yet in these earlier years of his long life, the main bogeyman and arguably the greatest threat to his own power was Simon de Montfort. Simon de Montfort, the leader of the rebelling baronial forces, was actually born a French nobleman, a younger son of Simon de Montfort, 5th Earl of Leicester. Unlike the undoubtedly unwarlike King Henry, Simon was a crusader and fighter. He had likely participated in the Albigensian Crusades of the 1220s. Originally, de Montfort had been a favourite of the king, having come to England to reclaim his father's former earldom. He was successful in 1239, but things quickly soured as it emerged that Simon had secretly married Eleanor, the king's own sister, even though Henry's widowed sister had taken a vow of perpetual chastity following the death of her first husband, William Marshall. In addition, Simon was heavily in debt to the Queen's savvy uncle, Thomas II of Savoy, having named King Henry as his guarantor. Henry's anger at the former offence apparently boiled over into a public row, with the king exclaiming that Simon had seduced his sister, with him even threatening to lock him in the tower. Simon wisely elected to go on crusade again as part of the English contingent under Henry's brother Richard of Cornwall, and on his return even acted as Henry's lieutenant in Gascony in 1248, overseeing the campaign against rebels in the region. Simon's personal issues and wider belief in reform saw him become one of the big three confronting Henry directly in 1258. Now he led the reformers in the field. Having spent the spring of 1264 preparing for war, the Royalists under Prince Edward captured Northampton along with Simon's son. In response, Simon besieged Rochester Castle in Kent, but faced stubborn resistance from the Royalist defenders for eight days. Henry moved his forces south in what appeared to be an attack on London, whose people were hostile to him. However, Henry's true target were the lands of Kent and Sussex. He wanted to keep the channel ports open to receive support from his French allies and keep communications open. Simon, however, moved to intercept the king. Meanwhile, Henry's forces attacked a baronial unit near Rochester, capturing many and even torturing some. The Royalists made further gains by capturing Tombridge Castle on May 1st. However, having reached Romney, Henry was harassed by some Welsh archers loyal to the barons and moved to the sanctuary of the town of Lewis in Sussex, near the south coast. Simon was just eight miles north, having camped at Fletching as King Henry settled in for the night at the Priory of St Pancreas, while Prince Edward manned Lewis Castle to the west. The pieces were thus in place for one of the two great battles of the period. Heavily outnumbered, de Montfort sent terms to Henry through the bishops of Chichester, London and Worcester promising to pay 50,000 marks and withdraw his army on condition that Henry accepted the provisions. Equally aware of their superior position, however, the overconfident royalists rejected them completely. The young Prince Edward, just 21 years of age, was eager to cross swords with de Montfort's rebels. To add to the baronial army's woes, Simon had also broken his leg, thus limiting his ability to personally lead his men, despite his martial reputation. After negotiations broke down, Simon led his army out of Fletching and towards Lewis. Having rejected the option of a night attack as dishonourable and cowardly, he set out at first light on May 14th. Having followed the road up to Offham, he left it and traced the nearby hill, the steepness of which masked his movements. Having captured the one sleeping lookout on the hill, de Montfort continued his advance undetected towards Lewis, 
Simon's army was only around four to 5,000 men, with around 600 or so cavalry, with the Red Crusader Cross emblazoned on them. Baronial forces were arrayed in the three traditional battles, with Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester, commanding the centre, the left by Sir Henry de Hastings, who had fought in two Welsh campaigns, and finally the right was led by Simon's experienced son, Henry. Sir Henry's battle consisted mostly of lightly armed and armoured Londoners, which would prove decisive as the battle raged, another additional reserve of Londoners were also present and to the far rear were Simon's baggage carts. The Royal Army was significantly larger at around 9,000 men, with 1,500 armoured knights. Leading the right battle was Prince Edward himself, opposing the inexperienced Londoners of Sir Henry's division. Surprisingly, perhaps, Simon took the initiative by ordering a charge. The Royal Cavalry responded and the battle began with a fierce melee of night-on-night -night fighting. Only facing a thin line of knights at the front of Sir Henry's Londoners, Prince Edward's right smashed into them. Overwhelmed, the routed Londoners proved too tempting a prize for Edward, with some fleeing west to the cover of some woods, and others east hoping to swim across the ooze to safety. Edward had good reason to pursue them with a rabid bloodlust. His mother, Queen Eleanor, had been pelted with stones and rotten food in London as her barge had passed under London Bridge just a year before. For a man like Edward, who would later be so influenced by current events and his need for personal and royal honour and authority to remain untarnished, such an insult could not go without bloody answer. Edward hacked through their fleeing ranks and even managed to ravage de Montfort's baggage. However, Edward's impetuousness had overall cost the royalists dearly. In his absence, Simon de Montfort had triumphed. King Henry was a prisoner in St Pancreas's priory. Simon, having witnessed Edward's charge, had used his reserve of Londoners to overwhelm the royalist centre and left. King Henry himself had fought well, having two horses killed from underneath him while fighting off the Earl of Gloucester's assaults, but it just wasn't to be. Henry and his bloodied bodyguards retreated to St Pancreas. Richard of Cornwall's left had also broken under the assault with no support from the heavy cavalry. The day lost, Simon's men surrounded Richard in a mill and forced his surrender. The man who had called himself King of the Romans emerged filthy from his hiding place to be paraded like a prize through Lewis. Edward too, despite his own victory on the right, was also taken prisoner. King Henry surrendered the next day with the so-called Mies of Lewis, effectively making Simon de Montfort a king in all but name. With King Henry, Prince Edward and Richard of Cornwall in de Montfort's custody, the reforming barons set up a government based on the 1258 provisions of Oxford, effectively reducing King Henry to a king in name only, as all decisions even concerning the king's own household and affairs, were the province of a council led by Simon de Montfort himself. Yet, just when Simon thought he had true and permanent reform in his sights, things began to go terribly wrong. Simon's greatest ally, Gilbert de Clare, had fought with Simon at Lewis, but had grown weary of de Montfort's growing power and defected to the royalists. Arguably the final straw that re-sparked hostilities was the escape of the Lord Edward himself in May of 1265. De Montfort had allowed several visitors, including Edward's friends Clifford and Lebon, as well as the estranged Earl of Gloucester's younger brother Thomas, to see the captive prince. Edward and Thomas were further permitted to ride out of the city of Hereford to exercise their horses. They rode every animal to exhaustion even those of their guards, well, that is, all except one, which Prince Edward used to gallop away to freedom, allegedly shouting back as he did so, Lordings, I bid you good day, greet my father well, and tell him I hope to see him soon, to release him from custody. The escape was not just sensational, but obviously well planned. It probably helped to cement the new alliance between the defecting Earl Gilbert the Red and the Royalists. De Clare would support the king and restore him to his full powers if Henry, more properly Edward really, promised to uphold established laws 
banish aliens from court, a major cause of the entire conflict to begin with, and only rule through native men. Edward was joined in his opposition to de Montfort by the Marcher Lords of Wales. They contained de Montfort in Wales by destroying all the bridges crossing the River Severn, thus cutting the reforming barons off from support in the east. Simon was effectively reduced to moving his small army around South Wales, with King Henry III in tow, while Edward and his formidable coalition hunted them. Some good news came when a message for aid got through to Simon's son and namesake, who responded by heading west with reinforcements. Edward, of course, quickly moved to counter this new threat, force-marching his knights through the night to fall upon the unsuspecting Montfortians at Kenilworth. He killed many in their sleep on 2nd of August. Young Simon himself only narrowly escaped by supposedly rowing naked across the nearby castle's moat. Simon the Elder used Edward's absence dealing with his son to cross the Severn and marching under cover of darkness reached Evesham on the morning of August 4th at around 5am. For the rebels, not all was lost, as though young Simon had been defeated at Kenilworth, he and his army were not broken, and there was still hope that they could unite their two armies. Alas, however, a lookout atop the Tower of Evesham Abbey called out, We are all dead men, for it is not your son as you believed. Prince Edward had not been deceived, and had actually shadowed de Montfort's night march. Using banners captured from his dawn attack at Kenilworth, the Lord Edward had advanced the last few miles unmolested, and now had de Montfort's forces trapped. Trapped, given Evesham is situated in a loop on the River Avon, with all easy routes blocked off, except from the north. It was in the north that the Lord Edward and Gloucester arrayed their forces at the top of a hill. Simon de Montfort, in a grim show of both pride and admiration, is supposed to have exclaimed, How skillfully they're advancing! They've learned that from me! Indeed, the old master would soon be severely tested by his erstwhile students. With his 10,000 or so men, Edward positioned himself on the left, with Gilbert de Clare on the right. At Lewis a year before, the baronial forces had worn crusader crosses, but now the royalists took this symbol for themselves, adorning red crosses as a great thunderstorm developed overhead. Simon's 5,000 or so men were now disadvantaged as the royalists had been a year before, with Edward holding the high ground this time. Yet the rebels on paper were bolstered by Welsh infantry provided by Llewellyn up Grefford. This would prove decisive, but only because they withdrew very early into the fighting. De Montfort's aim, though perhaps overly ambitious, was to smash through the royalist centre with his own army. But this wasn't to be, despite the tactic actually being initially successful. The much larger royalist army merely closed around their enemy, absorbing the charge with the battle rapidly devolving into a massacre. Edward, contrary to the normal rules of chivalry, had let it be known that no quarter or mercy would be given to Simon and his men. Edward had suffered a humiliating period of captivity under de Montfort's brief reign, and his mother, Queen Eleanor, as we have noted, had also suffered the indignity of being pelted with stones and rotten food as her barge had passed under London Bridge, something Edward partly held Simon responsible for. Furthermore, and perhaps most importantly, Edward regarded Simon as a traitor, having usurped the power of the crown, his future crown, and besmirched its dignity. For these offences, there could be no mercy. So it was that 4,000 or so men of de Montfort's army were destroyed. Simon de Montfort himself was marked for particularly special and brutal treatment, with Edward assigning a hit squad of around a dozen men whose sole task it was to find and kill the Earl of Leicester. In the event, it was the marcher lord, Roger Mortimer, who struck the killing blow, ending de Montfort's life with a lance through the neck. Simon's body was then set upon, his hands and feet being hacked off, his battered corpse then decapitated, and even his genitals being carved away and stuffed into his lifeless mouth. In a final insult, the head was sent to Mortimer's wife as a grim token of his victory. Mortimer 
having himself satisfied a personal grudge against de Montfort. This bloody work concluded, the battle was almost marked by personal tragedy for Edward. Amidst the chaos, one man adorned in Montfortian armour was wounded in the shoulder, yet screamed at this, I am Henry of Winchester, your king. Do not kill me. Roger Le Bon quickly acted, spiriting the king away from immediate danger, but it was Prince Edward himself who escorted his father from the field, absolutely triumphant over perhaps his most dangerous enemy. Evesham was bloody and decisive enough that it really should have marked the end of the rebellion against King Henry. The barons under Simon de Montfort had suffered 80% plus casualties, with around 4,000 massacred following their charge into Prince Edward's ranks. However, if the Lord Edward had hoped he could use this decisive victory to wrap up opposition and finally restore the power and rights of the crown, then he was very mistaken. Unfortunately, his father King Henry could not be counted upon for a wise peace policy regarding the defeated Montfortians. The garrisons at Windsor Castle and the Tower of London surrendered quickly once news of de Montfort's death had spread, but his seat of Kenilworth Castle did not. Simon the Younger had retreated there after Prince Edward's successful dawn attack outside the castle, immediately preceding his march to Evesham. Simon Jr. had arrived too late at the battle, but with time enough to witness the gruesome spectacle of his father's head being spitted upon a pike and paraded about. Despite the temporary suspension of the rules of chivalry at Evesham, Edward realised that to create a lasting peace, mercy would be required. A surrounded enemy with no means of escape or hope will likely fight to their last breath, but a man given a way out of the melee would more than likely come to terms. King Henry, by contrast, didn't seem to understand or care about this subtlety and imposed harsh penalties on former Montfortians. Edward had sent a letter to Kenilworth promising death and disinheritance to all those who resisted, with the implication thus being that all those who did submit would not face such a punishment. But his father undermined this by proclaiming that all land seized by loyalists from rebels could be retained and that any who stood against him were now disinherited forever. The remaining rebels thus had nothing to lose from continuing to resist with all of their remaining power. April 1266 had seen this mess expand, with the defeated rebels reducing the counties of East Anglia, Hampshire and in the Midlands too. On 15th of May 1266, Henry of Almain confronted a rebel force at Chesterfield under the Earl of Derby. The battle ended ignobly for the rebel commander Robert Ferrers with him being stricken with gout and unceremoniously unhorsed before being delivered to London in chains. Edward himself dealt with another group in Hampshire who had been terrorising locals from their camp in Autumn Wood. Edward even engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the rebel leader himself, Adam Gurdon, whom he initially spared but nonetheless sent back to Windsor for imprisonment. Meanwhile, the siege of Kenilworth dragged on for six months through the rest of 1266. Much had been made of the formidable defences of the structure, not least the huge artificial lake that guarded its western approaches. Yet, no structure could be forged against time itself and a new political settlement. In August, a parliament assembled at Kenilworth, and by the end of October, a compromise was forged by the more moderate voices led by Cardinal Otto Biono and Henry of Almain. The so-called Dictum of Kenilworth allowed a way out for the disinherited. They could recover their lands after paying substantial fines several times their income. However, after and not before. It was a step in the right direction, but not quite enough. For many, this was still too harsh a settlement, though it induced the surrender of the castle on 13th of December 1266. The logic was that the rebels would be punished while still being able to eventually recover their lands, while the loyal royalists would be rewarded and remain as occupiers. It was this last fact that stuck in the throat for the disinherited. This proved all too consequential for prolonging hostilities 
given rebels hold up on the Isle of Ely, fought on against King Henry himself, with an attempt at invading the island, devolving into a dismal failure, the king's men suffering heavy losses. Worse still, the powerful Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester, and a rare breed of man who had been on the winning side at both Lewis and Evesham, now ominously sided with the remaining rebels. By April of 1267, he had moved his men into London, forcing the Cardinal Otto Biono, who had been tasked with holding the city, to hole up in the tower. Reinforced by rebels from Ely, Gloucester quickly gained the support of the Londoners, and the capital was geared towards resisting a siege. Earthworks were raised, and ditches were being dug. King Henry's ill-advised policy of total disinheritance, then heavy fining and occupation for years, was unfortunately bearing its rotten fruit. There was now a good chance of the resistance flaring up into another full-scale civil war. However, despite moves made by the Royalists to enlist mercenaries from the continent, as well as Edward and Henry moving with a large army south towards London, cooler heads once again prevailed. Otto Biono once again proved the conciliator, along with the king's brother, Richard of Cornwall. The cardinal helped set up a relief fund for the disinherited from the clergy, and under Cornwall, a crucial amendment was made to the dictum of Kenilworth. Henceforth, the rebels could reoccupy their lands immediately, and not after the repayment of their heavy fines. It had been the prospect of the sight of their erstwhile enemies occupying their lands for years to come that had proved a humiliation too much. Also, since this had been the chief demand of Gloucester, he stood down his own forces, and the threat of renewed civil war thankfully ebbed away. So it was that a conflict that could have been ended shortly after the Battle of Evesham in 1265 was actually ended in 1267, prolonging the violence in the kingdom thanks to the ineptitude of King Henry and the harsher, hardcore royalists. Having defeated the rebel barons under the leadership of Simon de Montfort, Prince Edward Longshanks wanted to thank God for his victory at Evesham by heading east on crusade. The idea of an English crusading force had been in the works since the middle 1250s and had, for obvious reasons, been placed on the back burner. King Henry's Welsh, Gascon and baronial conflicts centred his attention and that of his son and heir firmly in England. In recent years, King Henry and his son, the Lord Edward, had fought the two great battles of the Second Baron's War at Lewis and Evesham, finally putting down the revolutionary forces of Simon de Montfort in 1267. A compromise had been reached with the so-called disinherited, those men who had sided with Montfort and had had their lands confiscated. Having to pay large fines for their defiance, the idea of an expensive expedition to the Holy Land was likely ridiculous to these men. However, the Royalists were in better financial fitness, many the recipients of the aforementioned fines. Many of the victors of Evesham may have also felt a genuine debt of gratitude to God for their triumph, and perhaps a shade of guilt over their actions at the battle, with all ideas of chivalry suspended and the bloodletting gruesome. Another factor driving on men like Edward towards actually taking the cross was the omnipresent rivalry with the French. In March of 1267, King Louis IX of France had announced his plans of taking the cross for a second time, which only emphasised the unfulfilled vows sworn in England in 1250. Edward, though, was ironically a victim of his own success. During the conflict with the barons, he had proven a shrewd general, politician. Though he had sided with his father's decision to completely disinherit the Montfortians in the aftermath of Evesham in 1265, he was perfectly aware that a more conciliatory approach was needed. Though he suspended any notions of mercy at Evesham, he was wise enough to use mercy to achieve long-lasting peace. At Lewis, he proved brave if hot-headed, winning his section of the battle, but arguably causing the overall loss of the Royalists, who were defeated in his absence from the field. He had made up for all this by successfully escaping de Montfort, then outmanoeuvring and defeating him in 1265. Understandably then, despite his own famous religious convictions, King Henry III was not overly enthusiastic about losing his valuable son and heir, potentially for years, 
so soon after the troubles had been suppressed. Even the Pope himself, who you would have thought would have been all for it, following consultation with English representatives, urged the Lord Edward not to participate. As you may have guessed though, Edward was having none of it. In 1267, the domestic front was further calmed with the Treaty of Montgomery, which effectively settled matters in Wales. The main impetus behind Llewellyn Ap Griffith's attacks was the unresolved political situation there. Now his title of Prince of Wales had been officially recognised by Henry under the latter's suzerainty, there was even less excuse to retain the prince. By the end of 1267, despite his father's and papal reservations, Edward had decided to go. By the early months of 1268, even the ageing king was convinced. On Sunday 24th of June of 1268, the Feast of St John the Baptist, Cardinal Otto Biono preached at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Northampton, where a special parliament had been summoned. The church had been built by a knight of the First Crusade in imitation of the original Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem itself. It was here that Edward, his younger brother Edmund, as well as their cousin Henry of Almain, took the cross. These, along with Edward's friends Roger Clifford, Roger Le Bon, and William de Valance, as well as the powerful Earl of Gloucester, Gilbert de Clare, also known as Gilbert the Red, on account of his hair colour or perhaps his fiery temper. As well as those prominent men, hundreds followed their example in what must have been an emotive and exultant day. Interestingly too, Eleanor of Castile, Edward's young wife and future queen, also took the cross. Just a month before, similar joyous scenes had accompanied the birth of the couple's second son, Henry, named after the king, his father. They married in Burgos, modern-day Spain, back on November 1st of 1254, in a decidedly political match to secure the English possession of Gascony from the claims of Alfonso, the King of Castile. What had begun as a political match did, however, develop into a true love between the royal couple. The future Queen Consort, mothering 16 children in total, and Edward later in 1290, being genuinely devastated at her loss, erecting the now famous Eleanor Crosses, the most well-known being Charing, between 1291 and 1295. Though high-born female participation in Crusades was generally discouraged, by this time it was certainly not uncommon. Famously, some time before, Eleanor of Aquitaine herself had accompanied her first husband, King Louis VII of France, during the Second Crusade. More recently, Eleanor de Montfort had accompanied Simon and Queen Margaret of France followed Louis IX on his first expedition, though she elected to remain home this time. Margaret's son Philip intended to take his wife Isabel with him, and even Edward's own youngest sister Beatrice intended to follow her husband, the son of the Duke of Brittany. Circumstances that almost obligated Eleanor too to go. Indeed, such high-born ladies would have had no less would have would have had no lesser conviction in the cause than their more martial husbands. Yet Edward still had the not-so-small matter of funding his campaign to deal with. From the First Crusade onwards, the usual course for knights was to mortgage or even sell their estates to finance their time overseas. Indeed, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, Robert Curtos, mortgaged his Duchy of Normandy to his younger brother, the second Norman King of England, William Rufus, in just such a manner to fund his fight with the infidels. Edward did have income from his own estates, but he could also reasonably expect funding from a more organised source too. Funding by the papacy itself had developed into a well-oiled and centrally administered institution, using many techniques that modern charities use today, with collection boxes placed in churches and individuals encouraged to leave money in their wills. Another method was encouraging the non-military classes to take the cross, at least symbolically, and then redeem these vows in exchange for cash payments. All of these revenues were channeled towards financing the kind of campaigners the papacy actually wanted, those high-born or knightly men who actually possessed the appropriate martial skills and military experience. As such a prominent warrior, Edward could have reasonably expected such support. However, once again, his father stalled matters for his initial opposition his application perhaps seen as a non-starter 
Otto Biono, the legate who had proved so useful in bringing the baronial conflict to an end, and also pushing the English to a final commitment to the crusade, tried to reverse this decision, but was unable to before the Pope died. With this source of income denied, Edward naturally turned to the laity in England, but, as you might imagine after the several years of civil war, a revolution in 1258 sparked by the excessive monetary demands of the king. Any form of substantial tax from the Knights of the Shires was ambitious to say the least. It had been King Henry's excessive demands for revenue from the worthies of the localities that had caused many to throw their weight behind de Montfort to begin with. In the end, Edward and the Royalists hit on another target that would ease the strain on these local knights, the Jews. That the three to four million inhabitants of Edward's England were overwhelmingly devoted Christians goes without saying. Yet there were a small minority who were not, and by Edward's day, having small groups in most major cities, mounting to around 5,000 souls in total, as is the way with differing cultures, the Jewish folk having different beliefs, rituals and appearance, this already left them open to marginalisation, persecution. The Pope's prohibition on Christians practising usury, or charging interest for borrowed money, in the 12th century effectively created a Jewish monopoly on the practice, which combined with the aforementioned made the people decidedly unpopular. In England, the Jews had a special exploitative relationship with the crown, they effectively being considered property of the crown, to be taxed at will, the so-called tallage, with an individual's loans and assets reverting to the crown on their death. Yet as harsh as this sounds, there was also the common sense requirement to at least allow a degree of prosperity and thus keep demands moderate if this cash cow was to turn a profit. Henry III, though, could always be counted upon to mess things up. Unable to obtain taxes from Parliament, he had demanded excessive tallage from the Kingdom's Jews, milking them relentlessly. In the twenty years between 1240 and 1260, Henry had exacted twice the annual average that had been normal before this period. This short-sighted policy quickly had knock-on effects beyond the Jewish community itself. As a consequence of Henry's demands, many Jews sold their loans on at discounts to wealthy Christian speculators who were wholly uninterested in the principle or interest of the loan itself, but more the land put up as collateral. A few ultra-rich individuals thus began to buy up loans at discounts and demanded immediate repayment of the smaller landholders, who often couldn't afford immediate full repayment, and thus joined the ranks of the dispossessed. Such concerns for existing smaller landowners, those same men of the knightly class Edward needed to grant his crusade tax, likely contributed to attacks on Jewish communities in London, Canterbury, Winchester, Lincoln, Bristol, Nottingham and Worcester between 1263 and 1267. Edward thus had his cause and a way to his tax. He and his cousin Henry of Almain tried to push for legislation and proper restrictions on money lending, particularly its abuse by the Christian land grabbers. They suggested such loans could only be transferred with the king's expressed permission, that such debts that were allowed to be transferred had to not accrue interest. Rent charges, or another way in which a debtor made annual payments from his property for his loan, were to be done away with as one method by which the rich land grabbers accrued land. Unfortunately for Edward, the proposed legislation did not have the desired effect. Perhaps the Knights of the Easter Parliament of 1269 simply had no faith that the law would be enforced. It's also likely those very same great men who had a vested interest in the status quo simply opposed it. On the upside, Edward had gone some way to funding his crusade. His father gave him the custody and revenues of seven royal castles, eight counties and the city of London. The undisputed leader of the crusade, King Louis IX, had no such problems, summoning a war council in Paris in the summer of 1269. Edward obliged by attending in August and received a further financial, albeit embarrassing, boost from the French king, who loaned him £17,000 to be repaid over 12 years. Though a large step in the right direction, it was still not nearly enough. Ominously too, the date of departure was set for one year hence, whether or not Edward was ready 
The prince returned to England in time to participate in the relocation of his namesake, Edward the Confessor's remains, on October 13. Yet though the ceremony went ahead in the partially rebuilt Westminster Abbey, the Knights of the Parliament were still unmoved to grant the needed tax. Further to Edward's financial woes, there was also the matter of the ever irascible Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester. Gloucester had grown cold in the face of both the settlement with Llewellyn in the March of Wales, which saw his interests affected, and also the treatment of Robert de Ferrers, who had almost been stripped of his lands and property for his alliance with the defeated de Montfort. De Clare's own relationship with Edward was complicated. Having fought on both sides during the Barons' War, he was also the greatest English participant in the Crusade, apart from the Lord Edward himself, and perfectly capable of disrupting the fragile peace that reigned after the conflict in England. He had taken the part of the disinherited rebels at the end of the war, despite helping Edward and his father triumph at Evesham, even taking London and preparing a large armed resistance before a compromise was reached. Edward spent the last months of 1269 in Chester and the North West, with a view to making a final push, both for his tax and reconciliation in the new year. As to declare, he luckily agreed to an arbitration through Richard of Cornwall. Meanwhile, Edward and his fellow crusaders set about persuading the Knights of the Shire to grant their subsidy. One major demand was a confirmation of Magna Carta, which would actually soon come, but the mark to which Edward had aimed was finally struck. On May 14, 1270, King Henry ordered an immediate enforcement of the legislation regarding the Jewish debts. Two days before, Edward's crusade tax had been granted in a clear quid pro quo. Edward and Gilbert de Clare agreed not to attack one another's lands during the period, with the latter agreeing to leave for the Holy Land a year after the prince's departure. Things then began to move fast, though the money from the tax took a frustrating few weeks to collect. Edward mustered around 225 knights, though in actuality the whole number going numbered more like a thousand, when we consider all the attendants, such as valets, tailors, stewards, clerks and such. Edward, having concluded his affairs in England by appointing a committee of five to oversee his lands, set sail for the rendezvous from Dover on 20th of August 1270. At the earlier Council of War, the expedition's overall leader, Louis IX, resolved to depart from France no later than August 18th. Edward had originally wanted to land in English Gascony to resupply and augment his small force there, while also seeing to its security before his long absence. But, pressed for time, he moved some 600 miles directly through France, reaching the rendezvous by the end of September. He was not surprised to learn that King Louis and the main crusader force had already departed in the beginning of July. Perhaps unsurprised at this, more surprising news then reached Edward's ears. Instead of heading east to the Holy Land, Louis made a last-minute detour to North Africa in an attempt to secure the subjugation of the city of Tunis for his brother Charles of Anjou, who was the King of Sicily. Worse still was that Louis was dead, having succumbed to plague on 25th of August, just days after Edward had departed from England. Many French crusaders had also fallen to the plague, and also succumbed during a storm on their way back to Sicily. The new French king, Philip III, gave up the current enterprise as a lost cause, and headed home via Italy. Edward had encamped in Palermo by January of 1271, but resolved to go east. By Edward's time, the vast territories carved out in the First Crusade had been decidedly diminished. The Holy City itself was retaken by the Muslims in 1187, and the famed Kingdom of Jerusalem had been reduced to a thin coastal strip of land, with the port of Acre acting as its capital. In recent years, the Muslim world had reasserted itself in the rise of the Mamluks, former slave soldiers under the leadership of the formidable Sultan al-Zahir Baybars. Caesarea, which had been fortified at huge expense, by Edward's would-be crusading companion, Louis IX, had been captured in 1265. Antioch had fallen three years after this, while more recently the greatest crusader castle, Crac de Chevaliers, finally fell after an arduous siege in the spring of 1271. Edward's arrival at Acre, with his small force of knights, 
was not enough to turn the tide, but must have been a refreshing infusion of hope for the beleaguered Christian world in the east, and certainly a sight for sore eyes for the citizens of the port city. Yet just as Edward's arrival had boosted spirits, so had it stung the resolve of Baybars himself, who was besieging the Christian city of Tripoli, some 100 miles north. Baybars clearly regarded Edward as a credible threat as he quickly granted a 10-year truce to the city before moving south. He attacked and seized the Crusader castle of Montfort after a short siege before marching to the walls of Acre itself and releasing the prisoners unharmed. Such a display of magnanimity actually had a sobering effect on Edward and his companions. He now witnessed the might of Baybar's army first hand and knew he had little hope of fighting him effectively. How could he and his few hundred men contest the Mamluk hordes that typically numbered in the thousands and sometimes tens of thousands? The Muslim Sultan's demonstration before Acre was clear. Edward and the wider Christian people in the area were there at his pleasure. Edward clearly had no ambitions for a suicidal confrontation to challenge this, so Baybars withdrew the next morning. Yet if the lesson was understood, this didn't stop Edward acting at all. In July of 1271, despite a vastly inferior force of just a few hundred knights, Edward left the safety of Acre and attacked the nearby castle of St George's Le Bain. The raid did considerable damage, but was ultimately a failure, due to crusader losses to both the foe and to the heat, with many dying of thirst in their heavy mail shirts. In this instance then, Edward proved a poor logistical thinker, the searing July heat doing horrible damage and exacerbated by an unfamiliar diet of raisins, fruit and honey. Having learned another harsh lesson about the realities of war in the Holy Land, Edward realised that if he was to stand a chance against Baybars and his tens of thousands of men, he needed to rethink his strategy. Raids at the height of summer were a bad idea, but he would also need allies. He wasn't entirely alone, with the Knights Templar and Knights Hospitallers of Acre having fought in the raid on St George's. The titular King of Jerusalem, Hugh de Lusignan, could also be counted upon. Hugh was also the King of Cyprus, and after some persuasion, some of his Cypriot subjects agreed to serve under the Prince in Acre perhaps some initial useful connections having already been forged during the last stage of Edward's journey when they briefly stopped off there. Furthering Edward's list of allies was his younger brother Edmund, who arrived in September of 1271 with more reinforcements from England. To further the aim of seeking allies, Edward had already sent emissaries upon his arrival to a local ruler of the Mongols. The days of the spectacular rise of the Mongols under Genghis Khan were likely within the living memory of some of the eldest of the region. The first and greatest Mongol leader, having died in 1227, establishing the largest contiguous empire ever, stretching from China in the east through southern Russia to the fringes of Europe itself. By the 1250s, the threat to Europe itself had waned, as the Mongols had begun to invade the Middle East. In 1265, Abagar, the great-grandson of Genghis Khan himself, ruler of the Ilkhanate, of, or Mongol Persia, married the daughter of the Christian Emperor of Constantinople, filling many with the hope that he would convert. But, though this hope was unfounded, the Christians could hope for a united antipathy towards Baybars and the Mamluks, making an alliance feasible. Edward had sent his ambassadors to this end soon after arrival, yet it took several months to convey his message, which was not surprising considering the Mongol leader's reply came from Maragheh, around 700 miles from Acre, which was located near modern-day Tabriz in Iran. Edward received news that there would be a Mongol response conducted by the Ilkhan's lieutenants. The actions themselves soon followed after the formal reply, with further news reaching the English prince's ears, that indeed thousands of Mongols were streaming south into the Holy Land. By October, they drove the Mamluks from Aleppo, some 200 miles away, which had the desired effect of provoking Baybars north. Contrary to their popular image of invincibility, Baybars did not fear the invaders, the Mamluks having beaten them some years previously at the Battle of Anjalat. In November, the Sultan and his host thus marched north. Now with a larger force, including Hospitallers, Templars, Knights from Acre and men from Cyprus, 
Edward felt sure enough to strike, and his target was the strategically important castle of Kakun. The castle commanded the road between Acre and Jerusalem, which meant that any crusader force that seriously wanted to capture the holy city would first have to seize it. They rose out of Acre on November 23rd. However, just like the earlier raid on St. George's Le Bern, Edward failed to capture the castle with its strong defences. The defenders simply needed, and did, hold out until a Muslim relief force approached. Edward did manage to slaughter many local herdsmen and seize many animals, though the whole enterprise was hardly a grand success. What's more, although the Mongols had answered Edward's emissaries in the affirmative, their expected attack from the north never truly came. Yes, the enemy had been driven from the city of Aleppo by the Mongol advance, but the Mongols had simply retreated once they learned of Baybar's own advance. By December, the Sultan had reoccupied Aleppo and received news of Edward's failed assault, apparently commenting scornfully, If so many men cannot take a house, it seems unlikely that they will conquer the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Although Baybars did head towards Acre in pursuit of Edward, he abandoned the effort as poor weather moved in, but more probably because it simply didn't serve his purposes to reduce Acre, given its importance as an economic hub. The Muslim state needed the prosperous city to function as much as for its own trade and prosperity as anything else, hence any serious move to take or disrupt it as a trading hub could only be detrimental to him. More important to counter for Baybars was the greater Mongol menace. The Muslim conquests in the area had given them control of the crucial north-south routes, which enabled them to do this. In effect, Acre as it was, was more an asset to Baybars than a pile of rubble. Indeed, the need was mutual, with the Christian capital being a lucrative area for Christians too, they being dependent on the trade, and Venetian merchants having an especially large stake in the city. For Edward and his men, steeped as they were in the Crusaders' black and white mentality, they were disgusted by the open trade and mutual toleration of the local Christians and Muslims, even attempting to enforce a ban on the practice, which the Venetians happily ignored. Despite this reluctance on the part of the Muslims and Christians, Edward was willing and eager to continue the struggle for Jerusalem, just some 70 miles distant even funding the construction of a new tower for the city walls. But his hopes must have been conclusively dashed when a 10-year truce with Baybars was agreed in April of 1272. As may be expected, having poured so much money and time into the enterprise, Edward was not signatory to this truce, one Muslim commentator stating, quote, he was not pleased when the peace was made and did not become party to it. Unfortunately for Edward, this made him an unknown and so dangerous factor to Baybars. It was this fact that precipitated perhaps the most famous incident of Edward's crusade. It began when one of Baybars' lieutenants arrived, signalling he was ready to betray his master. Edward, probably desperate for any good news, was happy to entertain Muslim messengers at court who bore gifts. It was, of course, all a trick as one of the visitors managed to secure a private audience with the prince and his interpreter, and seeing he was almost alone with Edward, took his chance and drew his dagger on 17th of June, which happened to be Edward's birthday. Edward was stabbed, but managed to fend off and kill the would-be assassin. The problem was that the blade could have been poisoned. It was at this point that legend has it that Edward's wife, Eleanor of Castile, proved her love and devotion to her husband, by sucking the poison from Edward's wound, thus saving the prince's life. That's the popular tale anyway. Another version of events is less flattering to the future queen. The aforementioned version was first reported half a century later by an Italian chronicler who prefaced his report with the cautious, quote, they say that other more sober accounts simply have Eleanor being led away weeping from the scene by John de Vesky with one of Edward's close friends, Otto de Granson, actually performing the deed. Regardless of who actually did the sucking, Edward had survived, but remained in deadly peril. The wound could get infected, and in any case, he was severely weakened to the point that Baybars, who most likely ordered the attempt on Edward's life, had effectively achieved his objective nonetheless, 
Edward's crusade was most certainly over. Though we know now that the future Hammer of the Scots indeed lived, at the time he seemed very close to death. The day after the assassination attempt, he even drew up his will, expecting the worst. The worst scenario indeed seemed to be playing out, the flesh around the wound blackening. However, in what must have been a tricky and painful procedure, this rotting flesh was cut away, saving the prince's life. The truce persuaded the English commanders to begin heading home. Edward's younger brother and potential replacement as heir to the throne, if his elder brother had succumbed, left the following month with others following throughout the summer. Edward spent some time longer, both coalescing for obvious reasons, but also for the sake of Eleanor, who had given birth to a daughter, Joan. It was in late September that the royal couple finally set sail from Acre. By early November, they were back in Sicily, under the hospitality of Charles of Anjou. Hampered by his wound, and perhaps beginning to enjoy his greater celebrity status, as news of his miraculous survival began to spread. It was while staying with Charles of Anjou on the Italian mainland that Edward was met with English messengers who hailed him as their king. <laughs> 